and put it together. So we've got these handy dandy sticks. Which We're here today at Hickory Grove Library, located in Mecklenburg County's so District 4, house, observing a free community pottery class, class conducted by Clayworks, a nonprofit I'm arts organization and the largest clay studio in Charlotte, Mecklenburg. <laughs> here we are, though. All right, now score this one. All right, this one's ready. Score this one. So same thing with your left hand, tick marks all the way down. That voice you hear, that's the voice of Jen Bourne. She's here with her daughter, Athena. Jen is also here with her father, Sam. Whatever. <laughs> Spread your fingers so it gets even. Not long ago, Sam was diagnosed with stage six dementia. Since December, Clayworks has been one way that Jen has been able to keep a close connection with her father. So there's not going to be any progress at this point. We just don't want, we want to um, delay any further decline. Um, but as long as he still, you know, can follow the repeated directions, you know, just with the constant reminding, getting him out, up and dressed, and a reason to do that in the morning um, is helpful because it, it keeps him connected and rooted in what's real in the world mm -hmm. um, at a time when things are start not making sense. Um, it doesn't take long to see that Sam was and still is quite the character. To this, so we're just building on our rainbow. 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 It's very, it's a happy place, the rainbow. That's why the programming that Clayworks provides is so important to Jen and her family. The free community classes offered through Arts and Science Council's Culture Blocks program allows her to connect with both her daughter and her father in meaningful ways. So, and in terms of, I mean, really the four-year-old and the senior have the same needs. They need community. They need to practice those cognitive, do those cognitive things that we normally do, but we have to make ourselves do in early childhood and later in life. Mm -hmm. Without that programming and the public funds that support it, Jen says there would be no suitable alternatives. So the only truly accessible programming is free. You know, if you say you want to be accessible for all, for everyone, it has to be free so that anyone, literally anyone can come. Someone off the street can come. Someone um, who has a fixed income, like many of our seniors can come. So there's really not any, I mean, our libraries, our parks, and our arts, our cultural sector are providing that accessibility. Um, in May of this year, Jen spoke to the Mecklenburg County Board of Commissioners in support of expanding the public funding that makes Clayworks accessible to her and her family. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jen Bourne. I'm here to talk about Culture Blocks and share a personal story about my experience with Culture Blocks. More than anything, Jen wants people who meet her father today to know that the man he once was lived a noble and honorable life of service. Um, so my dad, um, my dad was a hospital chaplain for 34 years. Um, and during that time, he brought the Catholic and Protestant communities together in the town that we lived. Um, he fostered um, ecumenical collaboration in the community. He sat on the board of um, homes and uh, housing authorities serving disabled populations. So, you know, he had a life of service and then dementia. There was no break. There was no downtime. And now I have this different dad than I grew up with, and I'm glad to have him. That is the most challenging part is that people see this person that's having a hard time relating appropriately, and they're never gonna know about those 34 years of service to community and um, to his church. For now, Jen will continue to bring both Sam and Athena to Clayworks programs to enjoy what she calls muddy fun. Yeah, 
That's what Claywork says. Muddy fun. Muddy fun. Right. How's the scoring? Oh, you rolled out the scoring. That's all right. Listen, tick marks all the way down. Why? Because that's how we attach it. Okay. Because it has to go tick mark to tick mark or it won't stay. Okay. But if you'd rather have it smooth, that's fine too. Do you want to have them be smooth? You can also do this. Hello, I'm Harvey Gann. Thank you for tuning into this podcast. I appreciate your giving time and attention to this critical decision that you face as a Mecklenburg County voter. As you probably know, the Mecklenburg County Board of Commissioners have approved a referendum for you to vote on in November that would levy a quarter cent sales tax to stabilize and transform the arts and cultural community. Those dollars would serve Mecklenburg County residents and visitors through arts, science, and history programming. They would also be used to support creative individuals and cultural organizations. The Arts and Science Council created this podcast to help inform and educate voters on why your tax dollars are needed and how the money will be used, and most importantly, who it will benefit. As you know, I'm a longtime supporter of arts and culture. I believe that if we want to create a more culturally connected and equitable community, this sales tax is something that you should support. Thank you once again for taking the time to listen to this podcast. Hi, my name is Valicia McDowell. I grew up in Charlotte Mecklenburg, mostly on the east side. I'm a product of busing in the Charlotte Mecklenburg schools that took me to Lansdowne Elementary, First Ward Middle School, Albemarle Road Junior High, and Independence High School. I went to college and law school at Duke University, am an attorney at Moore and Van Allen, and a mother. I am also board chair of the Arts and Science Council, also known as ASC. I'm honored to serve in that role because I believe that all of us in this community, no matter where we live or our socioeconomic status, should have access to arts and cultural experiences to educate, entertain, and enhance our quality of life. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen to this series of podcasts designed to inform and educate Mecklenburg County voters on the proposed quarter cent sales tax to stabilize and transform the arts and cultural community and ensure cultural equity. You will have a chance to vote on this initiative on November 5th, and listening to this podcast is one of the very best ways you can make sure you're prepared when you vote. In this episode, we're going to talk about the proposed sales tax, what it is, why it's needed, and what you need to know about it right now. We'll hear from members of the community about why they support this tax. We'll even sit in on a free community drum workshop with Drums for Life and hear what members of our community had to say about what they wanted from the arts and culture sector at a community dinner. I also encourage you to listen to the other episodes in this podcast series. Each of the other four episodes look at how arts and culture affect local groups, including children and youth, businesses, individual artists, and the community at large. First, we're going to answer a few questions we've heard from the community about this tax. Hey, everyone. I'm Andy Goh, co-producer of this podcast. Thanks again for listening. I'm going to ask Valicia a few questions about the tax. Valicia, what is this tax? So the cultural sector is proposing that we levy a quarter cent sales tax in order to fund the needs of the sector and for other needs that the county has as well. What is the everyday impact of this tax on Mecklenburg County residents? Nobody likes to do the math, but if you spend $100, then you would be paying an additional quarter, meaning 25 cents of additional tax. Why is the Arts and Science Council asking for this tax? We're asking for this tax because we're at an inflection point. Our funding has declined, and the result of that is that we can't get done the things we need to get done. There are two primary things that we need to accomplish. One is we need to stabilize the sector. So we need to be able to provide basic funding for our 
key organizations, right? Those are large organizations, emerging organizations. So that is a big part of what we're doing. The biggest part of what we're doing is we want to make sure that we can deliver programming to our residents where they live, delivering on the promise of cultural equity. So it shouldn't matter if you live in District 5 or if you live in District 2. You should be able to enjoy things in your neighborhood that are accessible potentially free, particularly for our kids, for our youth. We want to make sure that we're delivering that programming, and it will make everybody's life better. It'll make your neighborhood better. It'll give you something to do with your kids on a Friday or a Saturday night. We think that's important, and we believe this money will enable us to do that. Who's going to benefit most from this tax? Our citizens will benefit. And when when I mean citizens, I mean all of our citizens. So Charlotte citizens, the folks in our towns, surrounding towns, will also benefit from this. We really want to make sure that we're delivering this in each and every one of our county commission districts in a way that is equitable. I think everyone who is out voting for this is going to see this in their neighborhoods, and that's what we want. Why did the Arts and Science Council make this podcast? We wanted to make this podcast so that we could make the whole public aware of the issues at play. This is a complex, complicated issue. It's not something where we could just release a 30-second soundbite and say, vote for the tax and expect people to understand why we're making this ask to begin with. And we felt like as a matter of public trust, we wanted to share all of these ideas and get people's feedback and address their questions uh, so that folks could be heard in this process and that we would have an opportunity to explain the value proposition for why this is so important for our community. We expect this to be sort of an iterative process. We're going to be pushing out this content, but we know we're going to have questions and we're going to come back and we're going to do our very best to answer those questions. So this really puts us in relationship with the community and it allows us to be fully engaged with folks. And that's what we're about. I mean, folks can call in. And so they can call or text to 704-286-6288. If you call, you can leave a voicemail um, or you can text. But we want to hear from folks you know, because we want the feedback and because we want to respond to that feedback. Uh, in addition to the episodes that are in this season, closer to voting time, we're going to release a second season of the podcast with, um, with all of that additional information in it as well. Felicia, if the sales tax were to be approved, how would the money be allocated and distributed? Sure. So on July 2nd, the Board of County Commissioners decided that, and they determined that 45% or $22.5 million of the anticipated tax revenue would be dedicated to arts and culture. 34% or $17 million would then be designated for parks and greenways. 16%, which is about $8 million, would be dedicated for teacher pay. And 5%, which is $2.5 million, would go for any number of things for the six towns. So the towns could use the money for arts and culture or parks and greenways. That would be entirely up to those communities. You know, our goal is to make sure that this money is getting distributed in an equitable way. And we know that that is also the county's goal. So we'll be working with those folks to try to make sure that that happens. We want to hear from the public, and I know that the county does as well. It's also important, as we're thinking about how this money is going to be distributed, there's been a lot of discussion really acknowledging the need for transparency. I mean, this is a lot of public money. No matter how the money gets distributed, no matter who is distributing it, I think Everybody who's involved understands that there needs to be a high degree of transparency, a high degree of accountability. I expect that as a taxpayer. I assume most of the people who are listening uh, to the podcast expect that. We are prepared to do everything that we need to do to deliver on that expectation. Felicia, what would be the impact of not funding this tax? If we don't fund the tax, we really run the risk of destabilizing our core institutions and we certainly will not be in a position to deliver these types of services and offerings in an equitable way. There's just not enough money available right now to do that. And so what we see instead is certain areas and certain neighborhoods are benefiting and other neighborhoods are not getting the same level of benefit. So that's what will happen. And we will continue to see a decline in the funding. So if you like what you're experiencing now and we don't get this tax past, uh, you should expect that you will be experiencing less of it or you won't be experiencing it at all. From time to time, you are able to go to different events. You should expect that they will be more expensive. You should expect that students are not getting the same sort of exposure to these institutions that we want them to get. 
that's all going to get worse, not better, if we don't act now, and this is the way to solve the problem. Why is a sales tax the best form of designated public funding for arts and culture versus other taxes like a hospitality tax or an alcohol and tobacco tax? You know, a study group of citizens took a look at this issue and they looked at all of those different types of taxes. And, you know, different communities do it different ways. Sales tax is a way that other communities fund their cultural sector, but so is hotel tax and motel tax, things of that nature. For us, we had this already authorized tax. It's been sitting there since 2009, authorized by the state legislature. It has the benefit of growing with our community. So one of the challenges that we've had as a cultural sector is as our community has grown and become more diverse, our funding has been shrinking. You know, if we go with a sales tax, we should expect reasonably for that revenue from that tax to increase over time. And we would be the beneficiaries of that as members of the cultural sector. So there are real benefits in using sales tax as opposed to other taxes that could decline. So, for example, there are communities that have used cigarette tax, which is now completely in decline. And so now they're in some funding peril as a result of having made that choice. This is a choice that will allow us to have the funds for the sector grow with the community. What would you say to people concerned about this being a regressive tax, meaning that it impacts lower income communities at a greater degree? That is a legitimate concern. And we've really struggled with that. We struggled with it before we even raised the issue with the county commission. I grew up in a family that didn't have a lot of money, so I'm particularly sensitive to the notion of adding anything to anyone's bill. If we deliver on this promise of cultural equity, then the folks who would be impacted by the tax would also be the core beneficiaries of a lot of the money coming from the tax. So that's on us, right? That's on us to make sure that after we get this done, that promise of cultural equity doesn't get lost in the wayside. That's part of the reason why we wanted to do the podcast, because we want as many people as possible who are voting for this to say they are voting for this for cultural equity, right? So that that will continue to be the focus of this effort. So, But what I say to folks who say, why would you want to levy a regressive tax? I say, I want to invest in communities that are traditionally not invested in. And this is one way to do it. It's not perfect, but there's a lot of good in it. Felicia, could the Board of County Commissioners potentially change the allocation? Yes, the County Commission could change the allocation. They've indicated that they understand the importance of sort of following through on this promise. So we anticipate for the foreseeable future, this fund would be going to the cultural sector. And then again, it's on us in the public to hold the next Board of County Commission accountable to maintaining the promise that this County Commission Board is making to us in this effort. We as citizens can constantly tell our county commission, we want this money to be used this way. And we should expect that the county commission will be responsive to that. They've been responsive to this request. And I think we should expect that they would be responsive to similar requests in the future. There are so many challenges that our community is facing right now, including affordable housing, public transportation, education, among others. Felicia, why should voters support this tax? So when I think about this tax, I think it's important to remember that we these investments that we're talking about in the cultural sector will help to mitigate some of the concerns that people are talking about. You know, I had a conversation recently with someone. They were talking about discipline in schools. Art therapies can help to mitigate issues around discipline in schools. Economic mobility. Arts and culture were called out in the economic mobility report as a way to help build that sort of social capital, social trust that will help our kids from all of our communities be successful. It, this is not a fix. This is not the fix to all of those problems. It's just another mechanism to help address the concerns in our community. I think it's important to remember we're not suggesting that arts and culture is more important than affordable housing or education or mental health or food stability or any of those things. Indeed, we're saying the opposite. We understand that those things are more important. Right? Those are life and death things. And we believe that the local government should be investing in those things. And our local government, thankfully, is investing in those things. I mean, if you look at the city and the county uh, spend 
Together, I want to say that those budgets come in at around $4.5 billion. And the overwhelming majority of that money is being used on those types of things. We're talking about somewhere between 20 and $25 million that would be invested on an annual basis in the cultural sector. That's around one half of 1% of our local government spending. That feels about right, right? If we're doing over hundreds of millions of dollars for education, as we should be, and we've got significant investments in affordable housing and other things, spending around one half of 1% on things that can make our communities more rich, more healthy, with more trust between our neighbors, that seems like an investment that we can, as a community, get behind. I can get behind. I hope that other folks who are listening to this podcast can get behind. Do you have anything else that you'd like to say to the voters of Mecklenburg County? So for me, this is a very this is a very personal uh, discussion. So my exposure to the arts, my exposure to theater, it was like opening a door of possibilities that I didn't know existed. And I'm not a theater person. I'm a lawyer, right? So it's not like everybody who all of these children that we send to these programs are all going to grow up and suddenly be painters and dancers and singers, although some of them will and be incredibly talented at that. The point is that we need to cultivate imagination. And for me, that's a huge driving factor as to why I support the tax and why I'm here and working so hard on this. Kids need to be able to imagine broader possibilities for themselves. And they need to be happy at school. And sometimes the only thing that makes you happy is going into a room and drawing or singing in choir or doing doing something of that nature. And we need to be exposing folks, particularly our kids, to those types of opportunities. I also think it's really important in terms of placemaking, right? I live in a neighborhood that is fully developed. I live in Plaza Midwood and I love it, right? There's art on the wall. There are different people everywhere. Um, there's music constantly. We have festivals. There's not a person listening to this podcast that doesn't want to be able to, on a Saturday in their own neighborhood, go for a walk with their families or, or with their partner, at kick back, have a beer, and enjoy some music, right? Just sit and listen and relax and remember a different time or connect with someone over that experience. That's universal. That's, you know, that's humanity. All of those things are important. This is all about lifting the quality of life of our community and making it more rich and making it, you know, an easier, happier place to live, no matter what your paycheck is. That's why it's so important. That's why I support it. And that's why I hope other folks will support it as well. My name is Davida Galloway. Teens, children, family, people, period. We just need to express ourselves. And it's the lack of that expression that's contributing to a lot of issues. Providing these items gives them a way, you know, to just get it off their chest. Sometimes we just need to say the thing or do the thing or paint the thing, and we'll feel a lot better in the end. Daniel Valdez, president of the board of directors for Charlotte Pride. Um, but we know that there's also a return on investment. It, it is something that when the community invests in arts and culture, um, you're creating jobs, you're, you're bringing in tourism dollars, you are um, exposing people uh, to new things and creating awareness and education, creating a more unified and welcoming community. I'm Barbara Ann Temple. I'm the Vice President of Education at the Arts and Science Council. It's not just about having how many numbers of students can we have, you know, walk across the stage, but it's how many of them can walk across that stage and that diploma represents years of meaningful experiences where they're engaging and creative activities where they are becoming well-rounded human beings. I'm Matt Olin. I'm the co-founder of Charlotte is Creative and the host of Creative Mornings Charlotte. Um, and I truly believe that the greatest untapped resource here in Charlotte is our innate creativity. It is actually our deep responsibility to support that, encourage it, unleash it, and invest in it. Joni Phillip, Vice President of Capital Projects at Discovery Place. We're all humans, right? And for us, the lens is through science. And our goal is, you know, you might not be a scientist, you might not go into careers, but if you need to live a healthy, informed life, you need to at least have some basis or grounding in science to make decisions. Uh, my name is Nick Napolitano. 
Uh, I am a artist, muralist, and I also play in the tech space. And what the arts can do is really uh, tap into those, those things. The artists are able to dialogue in ways that a lot of people can't with the outside world and the change that's happening and the need for that change. So I think you can use these platforms, especially what I do with, with murals, as a way to, to drive that change because it basically is a large billboard for what we want to see, what sort of evolution could be possible. My name is Paula Martinak. I'm a novelist and a creative writing instructor. I teach at UNC Charlotte and also at uh, Charlotte Center for the Literary Arts. I, I've had so many people who have read a couple of my books, people who know me and have read a couple of my books and say, wow, I have never read something by an LGBT person before. And this is so exciting. You know, I, I didn't know that I would like it. I didn't know that there would be these universal themes. So I think it makes those, bri those bridges for people. So my name is Dr. Keith Cradle. I work for the Mecklenburg County Sheriff's Office as a youth program director and also sit on the board for the Beckley Museum and a few other nonprofits here in Charlotte. You know, it's one of those things, again, where people say culture for all. This is that statement manifested that we have to make sure that every kid, every parent in our community has an opportunity to be a part of this arts community and we can't have barriers that limit that access. We have to open it up. Virginia Wooten, I'm an attorney by day with Cranfield, Sumner, and Hartzog. Uh, also currently the president of the Young Affiliates of the Men. And one thing we're really lacking in society currently, I think, is a good way to have discourse. And I think a lot of art shows and a lot of you know art exhibits can touch on that. And they may mean one thing to a certain group of people. They may mean another thing to another group of people, but it's a good way of starting discourse between people. And that's something I think we really need in today's society. Local historian, Tom Hanchett. When we encounter the arts up close in our hands in a school setting, then we understand that we are innovators. We are creators. And I think it empowers us to take control over the parts of our lives that we don't like, but also to, so, to celebrate the parts that we do like. Well, my name is Aisha McMillan Cravada. I'm the Academy Director here at Charlotte Ballet. It's so important that we place intention behind what it is that we want to see, where it is that we want to live, what we want Charlotte to be. We must address it intentionally. So I am Quentin Talley, poet, actor, producer, director, but also artistic director and founder of On Cue Productions. You know, the arts feeds into every part of life. So it's a whole ecosystem that happens uh, when you have the arts and affects that, you know, that individual creative. Well, my name is Alvin C. Jacobs Jr. or Alvin Collins Jacobs Jr. And I'm an image activist for what happened when a country would overthrow another country. One of the first things that they confiscated or they stole was art. They absolutely tried to erase everything about that people, but they took the art and they held it in high value. Well, New York is New York, not just because it's so big and it's so densely populated. New York is New York because of art. That's what made New York great. That's what made Los Angeles great. That's what made Chicago great and Miami great. It's art. Food is art. Fashion is art. Painting and museums and exhibitions, all that's art. I didn't know what was going on. I was kind of a car heard the music. So my ears say, let's go this way. <laughs> That's why I'm here. We're at University City Library, located in Mecklenburg County's District 3, on a Saturday morning with Drums for Life, a nonprofit arts program that brings free instructor led drum circles to communities around Mecklenburg County. Frank, who was here visiting the library, didn't know about Drums for Life until just now, but says that he was drawn to the music that represents his heritage. Well, that's, that's our ancestors, and uh, it's part of our, my history. So in, anything that's dealing with that, drumming, Africa, I'm all for it. Provided for all of the participants are several djembes and dune dunes, complete with drumsticks and chairs. Anyone can sit down and play a rhythm, even if they've never sat behind a drum before. Participants can play along as best they can, and they're encouraged to improvise. Take my 
Drums for Life is led by Kojo Bay, who has been performing and teaching African drums as a healing art for more than 20 years. Drums for Life, we started in Connecticut about, uh, I'd say about 15 years ago. Um, we are a performing troupe. The troupe was called Sounds of Africa. And off of our performances, we would always get some people that wanted private lessons or special program for the community center or after school programs. And what people got from our Sounds of Africa performances was this healing spiritual vibe. And so I thought about what would I name the program, the after school program, and we came up with this Drums for Life program. So that's how it started initially off of our performing troupe, Sounds of Africa. Kojo talks about why access is so important for the community. Let me tell you the first thing, I, I could speak directly on that with Arts and Science Council, the programs that they support, they're all professional. And most of what I've experienced myself has been professional artists and, and professional facilitators. And it's really, really difficult to bring your family. I have a family, I have 11 children. So to be able to bring all of my 11 children to a free program by professional facilitators is really not a common thing throughout the U.S. And so I'm very thankful for that aspect of what Arts of Science does. So they bring this throughout the Charlotte community, quality programming at this very reasonable price, free most of the time. And it's very important because a lot of people don't necessarily have transportation to come to the bigger venues where you might see these professional artists performing. So here it is, Arts and Science Council is saying, we're gonna go out to the communities and you don't have to have reliable transportation. You can walk or it's right there in your community. You could come right on in. Another participant, Lavanya, also discovered Drums for Life today during her visit to the library with her son. I have, I don't know anything about Drums for Life, to be honest with you. However, I have been trying to get my son to play the drums, and he is resisting. I just happened to walk up on this, to be honest. My son is in, inside getting tutored, because I love drums. Okay. I love the African drums. I used to try to do the African dance, but... Lavanya says that learning drums is something she thinks is important for her son. Because I felt like that would be a good way for him to... I believe in arts because I'm an artistic type of person anyway. So I believe art is a good way for kids to learn how to do other things, like math, and you got to count the beats and all that. But And I just think it's a good way to get college scholarships and all of that good stuff. <laughs> so. Finally, Kojo says that with support from the community, organizations like his can continue to bring more experiences to more people. This here right now, what's going on in the city, this can affect what we do as an arts organization. And if you can help us to support this, then we could give more programming or continue the type of programming that the community is benefiting from. So I think it's very important that the community supports initiatives Mallard Creek Recreation Center, the Arts and Science Council is hosting a free community dinner as part of the Culture Blocks program. Colter, I see you. Yeah. These community dinners are free to residents that live in Culture Block areas. They are designed for neighbors to get to know one another over a meal, experience cultural performances, and for ASC to listen and learn from residents. Events like this force us to, I think, uh, to gather together. Absolutely. We encourage and ask for more events here in Mallard Creek so we don't have to travel outside. It gets dark early in the winter. So this is awesome. Great night out. Great. Dawn Anthony. Just love her. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're heavily involved in the community as it is. Uh, the YMCA. Uh, my son runs track with the Mallard Creek Recreation Center. So uh, we, we love our community. And so more opportunities like this to get us out would be great. 
Barry from Chef Henry Catering describes what's on the menu tonight. Um, we have uh, rice and peas, uh, Caribbean chicken, mixed vegetables, and fried plantains. Well, we always have a good vibe. We're, we're originally from uh, Trinidad, so we always have a, a nice, good Caribbean vibe going. The evening features great food, live music, and even a capoeira demonstration. Families and individuals of a wide range of backgrounds are eating, conversing, and dancing. But the Culture Blocks Community Dinner also gives residents an opportunity to share their feedback with ASC and talk about what they want to see more of. It would be nice to have some programs here for special need children. Um, like a dance competition, but instead of like between different teams, like between different styles of dance. Um, and then I'd like to see an outdoor movie night, maybe like a gallery crawl. Outdoor festivals, kind of like Matthew's Alive or the Greek Festival. Um, live music at the park at night with maybe some food truck options. We also had STEM program for the whole family and also a conversation club where you can learn to speak Spanish or Chinese with native speakers. Just to piggyback on that, sign language as well. Uh, Project Harmony. Um, Project Harmony is a place, is a music place, where you learn how to play different instruments. Field trips would be nice as well, affordable day trips for people to be able to go to. I would like to see more things for our senior citizens to do, especially the one that's in wheelchairs and can't get around like they used to. Um, a poetry slam, and then secondly, like if you did a spelling bee, but math style, so you have like a math off. Many of the themes and programs residents are talking about on this particular night are the same themes and programs we found while producing this podcast. If you listen to all five episodes in the series, you'll hear from a diverse group of people, but many of the themes we found are the same. Building bridges, creating connections, and enriching our community with a deeper and more sustainable cultural experience. Don't forget, if you're listening to this podcast, we want to hear from you too. Call or text us at 704-286-6288. That's 704-286-6288. If you call, you'll go straight to voicemail and you can leave a 30-second message. You can also email us at asc at artsandscience.org. We'll be listening to all of your feedback and we'll use some of your responses in a future episode of this podcast. My name is Dorlisa Fleur. Professionally, I'm principal of Fleur Advisory. It's a well-known fact that none of the major arts, be it a museum or a children's theater, no one from their ticket sales covers their cost of production or their cost of exhibition. And frankly, what it has meant in most of the organizations is that they've over time had to rely more on sponsorship dollars, which is corporate dollars, which means you're having to do those kinds of things that appeal to a corporation that may be trying to, bring, to build its own brand. Don't want to at all take anything away from that because that's been wonderful support, but it hasn't always allowed an organization to look out and say, where are the audiences that I'm not yet touching and that I'd really like to be able to touch? And that's where when you get the public support, I think you are able to just reach out and be so much broader in your offering and more inclusive in your audience. Well, I think we'd see a lot more of the color beige in Charlotte, and I'm not sure anyone wants to see the color beige anymore. Um, if there were less funding for arts, culture, science, and history in Charlotte, you're going to start to sense a disempowerment of all of our citizens. If we want to preserve arts in this community and we're tired of hearing that there's no culture here, we have to find the money and we have to put it in the right places, or we're going to be having this conversation 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. And I, for one, am tired of it. I know we have culture. But a lot of artists, that you know, they're working full-time jobs, part-time jobs, trying to fund the art they're trying to do. So, you know, by not funding things like this, these artists will find themselves in a catchment area of really not know knowing what they're going to do next. We need that pot of money to continue funding this. As I said earlier, you don't want to start getting stagnant. We, you know, we're in a great place of growth. These artists understand that but they need the funding too to do it. So. 
a suitable replacement for arts funding. I, I don't know. I mean, like, I'm, <laughs> I, I don't know what else would, would, if, if, if we're not funding it in our city or if the city's not supporting it, then I, I, don't, I just don't know what, what we're doing as a city. I mean, again, it's like, we can, we can have the rigid, hey, you go to work, you go to a brewery, you go home and rinse, repeat, but, um, what else is going to provide an alternative? What else is going to support unique experiences that create memories that people can associate with our city's identity? We've talked about why we support this tax, but don't take our word for it. Hear it straight from leaders in our community. Uh, my name is Nico Amortegui. I am a Colombian artist uh, based in Charlotte. They invest so much in art, you know, especially the biggest cities around the world. Um, that's what they do. That's their main goal is invest in art. Joni Phillip, Vice President of Capital Projects at Discovery Place. It's money well spent and it's a huge investment. And I know we talk about kids a lot. It's an investment into our whole community, from our seniors to our babies and cradles. It's an investment and all should have access to it. My name is Stephen Pierce. I'm Vice President of Economic Recruitment with the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance. If people care about these things, I would encourage them to consider this opportunity that um, is coming in November because it's important that we as a community demonstrate that we want to take the bull by the horn, so to speak. We want to craft our future. We don't want to just let our future happen. We as a community want to take the bull by the reins and we want to say, this is what we want to be. And we know that arts and culture is an absolute cornerstone. It's of vital importance for the continued growth and success of Charlotte. And isn't it still worth it though? If we're talking about Charlotte and the and we envision the Charlotte that we want to live in and create in and work in and raise families in, isn't it worth it? Because we understand the impact of art in the city, right? We understand that. And why wouldn't we want all of those things to be increased? Why wouldn't we want a more enriched, a more cultural, a more colorful city? No matter, no matter what, it's, it's worth it. It will always be worth it to me. Recognizing art's ability to heal a community is is huge, right? There is evidence that providing, you know, artistic experiences allows the community and that community's souls to vibrate differently, right? You are able to stand in front of something and it affects you. It warms your heart. It expands what you think is possible. And I think that heals people. It gives people permission again. When we get the designated revenue stream for our community, it's going to be a game changer because what's going to happen is that all of us citizens have collectively decided what matters most. And so what we're going to do is we're going to remove the number one barrier and that is how are we going to pay for it or how are we going to have access to it, right? So once the cost is out, there's going to exist this whole new world of possibilities. My name is Maddie Marshall. I serve as president of Historic Washington Heights. I think we all find peace in the arts. And I think it's time that we, you know, let that be known and see what a peaceful world we really have that's full of love, joy, peace, happiness. Thank you once again for listening to this podcast. If you've gotten this far, then you're clearly invested in helping our community make this important decision. No matter how you feel about the tax, I encourage you to talk to your friends, neighbors, and county commissioners. Finally, I ask that you take this knowledge with you as you vote on November 5th. As a voter in Mecklenburg County, this decision is in your hands. Please remember to listen to other podcasts in this series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe for free and you'll get the second season of this podcast featuring more in-depth information about the tax to be released closer to voting time. Don't forget to submit a rating and a review or just share this podcast with someone you know who cares about the future of our community. Want your voice to be heard on this subject? Here's how you can share your thoughts about the proposed sales tax. Text or call 704-286-6288 to share your thoughts. 
That's 704-286-6288. If you call, you'll go straight to voicemail and you can leave a 30-second message. Or you can send an email to asc at artsandscience.org. Your responses may be used in a future episode of this podcast. This podcast was produced by the Arts and Science Council and Gojo Studios. Writing, field recording, editing, and mixing done by Andy Go. Additional research and support provided by Krista Terrell, Bernie Petit, Lillian Parker, and Giovanna Torres. Original music by Harvey Cummings. It is so important for my dad to have access to opportunities to be creative, feel safe, and do what he can. Clayworks, the Arts and Science Council, and the Hickory Grove Library have all helped open a closed door and keep the lights on in my dad. I will always be full of gratitude for the gift of sitting at a table with my dad and my daughter and having muddy fun. Thank you.